All right. What is going on, everybody? Welcome back to another Serious Angler podcast. I am joined here with my good buddy, Mr. Andy Full, the master captain. What's going on, dude? I love it. <laughs> much, uh, excited for the Bills game that Bailey says does not matter tonight. And <laughs> yeah, we're about to have on a sweet Midwestern Oklahoma hammer. So this should be fun. Heck yeah. If anybody sees Andy going nuts behind the scenes and fist pumping, punching his phone or whatever, it's uh, the Bills are playing it against the Patriots right now, which I know he wants to clinch the second. Is what second in the a- in the AFC? Yeah, right now we're a half game behind Pittsburgh with basically a game in hand. So if we win tonight, we all but wrap up the second seed. Right. With a couple of other already, things that happen, but you'll be all right. You're already AFC East champions. Doesn't matter. You're already in the playoffs. See, exactly. It doesn't matter. It does matter. See, what so we should do quick little side note, real fast. Um, the Patriots posted something today with Gillette Stadium, and you could send a picture in to be put like featured on the broadcast for Monday Night Live. And I zoomed into it, and it's literally all Bills fans. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> like I, I don't know if you've seen it. Of like, when that? Are, like, I've heard stories of away games against the Bills and how a majority of the stands are all Bills fans. We're all over the country and proud of Mafia it. Mafia has the reputation. I think even uh, Brad's daughter, he said, is a Bills fan in Oklahoma. So that's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're going to get Brad on here in a second. Uh, we're going to talk with Brad about a whole bunch of different stuff, but you know, primarily talk about the 2020 open season you had, talk about some adjustments he thinks he needs to make for 2021 to get back on the Elite Series. Uh, for those who don't know, he was on the Elite Series back in 2011, I believe. We can talk to him about that as well. And then we have some some pretty good questions for him, you know, regarding you know shallow fishing and you know power fishing, different things along the lines of that. And you know, guys, if you do have questions for him too, be sure to. Uh, get him into us and we'll obviously feature him on the show. But uh, I hope everybody had a good Christmas. Obviously, you know, yeah. it's Monday after Christmas week. Hope everyone, uh, you know, had a good time with family. If you, if you were able to, I know uh, I got to spend time with my family, my girlfriend's family uh, sounded like you did as well. So that's always good. Oh, yeah, still hurting. I'm, hurting too. I'm, too many cookies. <laughs> <laughs> I'm more excited about anything else is the food more than like, Seeing family or getting presents or fish and stuff or whatever, it's always the food, especially the cookies. cookies. So at uh, my in-laws, so my wife's parents' house, we had beef tenderloin and prime rib. Oh, man. It was gourmet. Oh, Justin is asking what jersey is behind you there, Bailey. What jersey? Oh, this is actually I'll, – I'll get it down for you guys. Actually, I was talking. We were talking with Brad a little bit here. I mentioned how I spent six months at University of Notre Dame work for the athletic department, and they got me hooked me up with a hockey jersey because I helped out with the hockey department. And they hooked me hooked me one up and got my name on the back. So it's they should put the number one on there. <laughs> I was not number one. <laughs> <laughs> I was the uh, I was the the bum intern running around ninety to hundred hours a week. For <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's good stuff. <laughs> he goes thought so yeah justin it, it's a still a sick jersey it's pretty sweet Heck actually yeah. real quick too i enjoy right. watching notre dame uh hockey games the gold yeah. helmets and yeah they hooked me up with helmet. Helmet. yeah but yeah getting getting off track already we're not even uh having brad on yet but uh regardless hope you guys had a, a good holiday and uh we're excited tonight to get bradley on hope you guys are too be sure to submit some more questions. And obviously Andy and I have some more stuff to talk about, you know, once we get, we get off here with Brad, but uh, without further ado, we're going to have a quick word from Hobie and we're getting Bradley on. All right. What is going on guys? We are back and we are back with Mr. Bradley Holman. What is going on, dude? No, just having finished up Christmas. Like you guys are talking about <clears throat> trying to avoid all the sweets that are still left over in the kitchen. <laughs> um, I, I can't avoid the temptation. Uh, I the, have, pecan, the pecan pie suckers me in every single time. Always. The what? Pecan pie. Oh, Ooh. man. I, mm. I've never really had pie on Christmas. It's always been the, the Christmas cookies for me. Really? Yeah. Well, I don't know. pecans are a big thing out there in Oklahoma. Well, that's Oklahoma. what I was just thinking. Maybe that's in Oklahoma, Texas, but I, I know that, you know, throughout the South, pecans are a big deal. So maybe that's a Southern thing, the pecan pies, but yeah, they're, they're pretty good. Is well, it, I think is it another that has yeah. his, like, his own pecan farm or something? I don't even know what it's called. 
Yeah, Evers has a pecan farm. He does. That's right. He so I don't even know how that all works. That blows <laughs> my mind. <laughs> Just a nut that grows on a tree, man. That's all it is. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> That's sweet. That, that well, well, dude, before we get too deep into, I, I'm sure we're going to have some juicy questions and topics we're going to talk about tonight. But before we get into all that, you know, talk to us a little bit about, you know, how you got into bass fishing in the first place. You know, who installed the passion in you that's still with you today and that whole nine yards man like the start i don't know i i was probably a late bloomer in the tournament fishing i didn't um i grew up in two places kind of i had divorced parents and i my mom was in oklahoma and my dad was in east tennessee um and i would say that my dad definitely got me fishing at a young age and I was ate up with fishing from, from him taking me, but he wasn't a tournament fisherman or a bass fisherman per se. He just whatever would bite, you know? Um, when I was 18, I took a summer job with a group of guys there outside of Norman. I'd come back to my mom's house and was living in Norman, Oklahoma and um, was fixing to start school at the university of Oklahoma and started a summer job, with this plumbing company. Anyway, a summer job turned into 13 years later, and um, those guys all tournament fished and bass fished. And I would say that's probably who really drug me into down the road of tournament fishing. I was obviously aware of it as a kid, just from watching it on TV and TNN and Bass Masters and all that. But to actually compete in a tournament, I probably didn't do it until I was probably 19 or 20 years old. So, <clears throat> you know, it, 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 I probably started a lot later than a lot of guys um, that I compete against. That's, that's kind of obvious to me at this point, but uh, I've been doing it, you know, for, for a long time now at this point, and um, I've always loved it. Um, it's probably, you know, it's it's why I'm still doing it today for sure. It's just, it's 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 not because uh, we're getting rich off this sport or anything like that. It's it's, it's, it's about, you know, loving to get up. I, I love the bike, dude. That's my deal, whole deal, the bike. The bike, well, figure sure. out the puzzle, you know. Figure so out I'm just around here. here. On the bite, what was that first bite that got you just like glued in and you're like, I'm hooked forever? God, I don't even know. You know, uh, <laughs> I, was, I was so young when I started fishing. Like I say, I've been obsessed with it since I was so little. Um, I can just remember. Memorable. The, like they can remember at any point. Yeah. I, when I first started going to Grand Lake and, and was trying to get, you know, start fishing tournaments up on Grand I was in my early, early 20s, and, and a guy had kind of taken me under his wing and was trying to help me, but he hadn't been out on the water with me yet, and he kept telling me about those willow trees and the willow trees. And it's like July. It's like 120 degrees outside, and it's the middle of the day, and I hadn't had a bite all day long, you know. On a lake, it's got a lot of fish. I just didn't know what I was doing. And uh, he kept asking me, you know. He would look at me funny when he would ask me this question at night. He'd be like, you didn't get out of the willow trees? And I'd be like, no. And he would just kind of look at me funny. <clears throat> but I'll never forget – the day that I figured that out, you know, it was like 120 degrees up by myself. It's one o'clock in the day. The sun's beating overhead and I hadn't been bit all day. And I go up to these willow trees and I pitch this, you know, tube bait or jig or something up underneath this tree in the shade, you know, and it's like this deep up there. There's not going to be a bass up there in my mind, you know? Yeah, there was, there was a big one up there. And um, that bite just like amazed me and hooked me probably for, it's probably what suckered me into flipping the rest of my life, you know? Um, that that big of you live that shallow and that much heat, you know, that time of year was was pretty amazing. Heck yeah. Now, what were the water temps like? If it's like 105 and 100 oh. percent humidity? Yeah, we see we see 90 degree water temps here. 91, Ooh. 92. I mean, we, we 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 get up there. Yeah, for sure. Oh my god. Now, does that slow them down when the water gets that warm, or do you think they like actually speed up and have to eat more because? Their metabolism has to be just roaring at that point. Yeah, there's no doubt their metabolism is cranking. Um, that's probably why we end up with so many real skinny fish, you know, come Long September. Big head ones. Yeah, the big head, you know, look like a sheet of paper. Um, <laughs> yeah. We see those in August and September, and uh, that's probably what that's left over from. But uh, some lakes they still feed. Some lakes, obviously, you know, it, it, it starts to tone them back. It just depends on what part of the country you're in and how used they are to it. But, but, they definitely still eat in the heat of the summer for sure. Thank you. Yeah. So, so going back a little bit, you know, talk to us real quick about kind of like your timeline, uh, you know, getting to the level you're at now. And, and I'm not talking about, you know, you on the opens right now. I'm talking 
you know, you from, you know, a, a, a teenager getting into and realizing that you want to do this for a career. Like what was, what was your first route into trying to get into professional fishing? Well, like I say, I didn't fish bass tournaments growing up there in East Tennessee on Watts Bar, but um, I was very aware of what was going on with Bassmaster because it was on my TV every weekend. And I knew what tournaments were and I knew who all those guys were. <clears throat> but like I say, I didn't fish any tournaments. Um, when I moved back to Oklahoma and was here for the long haul after I was 18, um, Somewhere in that tournament fishing was like team stuff. I don't know where or when that changed, but somewhere in there, the guys that I fished with and the teams that I fished mainly fished in southern Oklahoma, which was the smaller lakes, and maybe a little bit in central Oklahoma, which kind of got us over to Lake Eufaula, which is a big lake. And um, I just I wanted to do more. And that was kind of the event. That was kind of about the advent time of the internet and things like that. You know, you guys got to realize I'm I'm older than than you two, but. Uh, um, started reading, you know, some online chat rooms and stuff talking about BFLs, and I guess at that time they were called Red Mans, um, and 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 participating in some of those. So I went and did that. I think that was somewhere around ninety nine, two thousand, and uh, somewhere in there. And then I got to fishing pro ams and um, competing at a higher level and fishing up in northeastern Oklahoma, up around Grand Lake. That just tends to be where the where the money kind of goes down and where um, the street cred is really earned in Oklahoma, uh, as far as the guys that, that come from this state. And, um, you know, I, I, I bumped around up there for five or six years, became very competitive and big team events and just everything that was going on in the state. And then um, probably jumped out around 2005, somewhere in there and went fish some open stuff. Um, qualified for the Elite Series 2006, and I competed on the Bassmaster Elite Series from 2006 to 2011, so I was there six years. And then um, by 2011, when I started all this, I just had one child at the house, and by 2000, we'd had our first baby, like right at that time, 2006, 2005. And um, by the end of 2011, we had three at the house, and it was it was time to come home and you know I wasn't I wasn't becoming Kevin Van Dam and that was obvious so um, I'd had some successes there it wasn't like it was all bad times I'd had some good tournaments and some good successes on the Elite Series six years well, I was there it, you had six years you had to have some yeah success. yeah and it wasn't ever a deal where I didn't qualify or anything like that or requalify because by, by that point you know they were kicking guys out. Um, I was just done. I was mentally frustrated. I wanted to be at home. So I came back home for a while and uh, I didn't really think, honestly, I was going to fish again. Um, I was pretty burned out, you know, which I see that in a lot of guys, you know. Um, now I see young guys come in and in the sports. It's it's good about chewing you up and spinning you out if you're not careful. And um, it, it did that to me to some extent. And I went back home in 2011 and uh, really didn't know what the hell I was going to do, but I knew I wasn't going to fish ever again. And uh, I'd actually told my wife that I was going to I sell my bass boat on my tackle. <clears throat> she was like, well, hold off on that, you know, because she'd known me my entire life. So we've been married for a long time. But um, I don't know. I came home and started working. Um, I went to work as a petroleum land man and, and a guy that I worked with, he had a son that was on the Elite Series at the time, and he had just gotten there. And so he didn't have a fishing partner, and he wanted to fish team stuff in Oklahoma. And I was working for him, and he was like, look, I'll pay for everything. All you got to do is just, like, show up, and I'll fish wherever you want to fish, do whatever you want to do. I just want to cash checks and be competitive. And now that Jared's gone, it's hard for me to do by myself, and I've got you, so let's roll. So I did that, and it became fun again. And I began seeing guys that I'd fished against, you know, back in the 90s and 2000s, some people I'd been friends with a long time, and it became fun again. It kind of got my fire going again. So somewhere around, around 2015, I wanted to go back, but I wanted to go a different route. So I went to FLW, and they wouldn't just let me in. I thought they would, but I, I ran Phoenix Boat at the time, and it was a Ranger-dominated circuit. And it was basically like, hey, look, buy a Ranger, and we'll let you in. If not, you have to qualify. 
And so I went through the Costas, which is what they were called then. Now they're the Toyotas. They've changed name through the years from different sponsor names. But um, I qualified. I fished two divisions, and I double qualified through two divisions. I think we had to finish in, like, the top ten or something then. But um, qualified for the FLW Tour. Started there in 16 and had been there since 19. So this was the first year that I wasn't on the FLW Tour, obviously, with um, MLF purchase and things going on there and just difference of styles of fishing and goals in life, I decided to go a different route. Right. Yeah, of course. So now getting back on track, obviously you've taken the route of you want to get back on the elite series. So you have to, you're going to mm-hmm. take the route through the opens. And I've heard it time and time again of how the opens this year has probably been, I mean, to this point, the hardest opens that there has been. Yeah. Um, not to jump to a question that I know is coming on this, because that's kind of what we were talking about. It's this open season. But but I, I've heard this a few times, you know, and especially from younger guys or guys looking in from the outside. And they're like, hey, you know, I know this year didn't go exactly as you'd planned or how you'd wanted it. Um, y'all got to remember, I've been doing this a long time. And for me to walk away from a tour level situation, which is where I was in at FLW when MLF purchased it, the checks and the amount of money that we pay out for entry fees and expenses and cost to travel, it's hard to travel that far and do these things when one, the entry fee is not high enough to recoup your money when you do get checks. So the money-making aspect of tournament fishing is extremely diluted. Like your chances of doing it are Basically, it's going to be the top three or four or five percent. That's basically going to be the guys that won one event, you know, or the guy that wins the points title. He's the only one of, of, of 300 guys that are going to do this, or 350 that's going to come out profitable. There's just not going to be very many. You, you guys get what I'm saying? Whereas yeah. when you're fishing for $10,000 checks at tour level, it's much easier to make that, that payback back to where you can at least get ahead or potentially break even. And I, I say we're talking about breaking even. Well, when you're spending thirty thousand dollars, breaking even is a big damn deal. You know what I mean? We're not talking about fifteen hundred bucks here over the cost of the year. So <clears throat> that itself makes it tough. And then on top of all that, you look at who all is trying to qualify, and the fact that they're taking, you know, the top four, um, and that's all they're taking. They're taking the top four out of each division, and then they gave us the top four out of the overall. Still, it's twelve guys. You know, some of the tournaments that we ran this year, McRaven was 225 boats or whatever, and Florida's kind of the same way. Um, that's not very many spots out of that many. You know, we're talking about 2% or less than um, are going to qualify. So even though I've been around the block, I've been fortunate in my life to have successes. I'm not a perennial AOY guy. I never have been. I wasn't even when I was in Oklahoma. Um I know that about myself. I'm dangerous. I'm really good at throwing up that hundred and something place finish. I'm really good at it. But I think that some of those risks that I take that allow that are also some of the things that have allowed me to, you know, win some tournaments as well. Um, But it's hard in AOI stuff. So anyway, to get to your point or what I was getting at when we're talking about my, what I would do different this year. I mean, going into the last open this year, um, I had a chance to qualify. And mathematically, it was there. So, you know, I told my wife whenever I jumped off the bridge of of leaving where I was that with the level of competition stuff, this is probably going to be a one, two, three year deal. This isn't going to be something that, you know, I mean, we might get lucky and make it the first year. You know, if some things go your way, you, you get on some fish in a certain tournament, and you, you know, you kick open the door and it happens. But more than likely, this is going to take two to three. And there's always that possibility that it doesn't work. Like, there is a chance that I'm stuck here. And um, that's it's, – it's very difficult to keep sponsors that I already have um, happy fishing at a regional level. Um, it's, just, it's just the nature of the business. And, and I have some of those right now that, um, you know, fortunately for me, the first year, everybody stuck with me. But going into year two, you know, there may be some difficult, you know, times that they have to they have to make their budgets and their marketing dollars where they want to spend it. And regional guys usually not where money spent. Regionals are usually where product is spent. And you know, so I knew this was going to be a tough endeavor when I when I bit off and took off and left. What I did, um, nothing was unexpected. Um, this year was 
weren't any highs. Like I, I didn't have any great tournaments, have any top tens. I basically just ground, you know, just kind of grinded along all year long. And then I kind of got in a little groove where I started cashing checks, cashing checks there in the last three or four. But um, going into that last event, I knew that I had to have a top 10 and that's what I tried to do and, and it didn't work out. But, you know, if I could have that opportunity every year, I'd take it. You know, I would take the same season. Um, looking back, you know, I look at the finishes and over the course of the year, I really didn't have a very good year at all and I still came really close. So, you know, with a little luck and a couple of prayers from somewhere, maybe, you know, I can I can uh, pull it together next year and, and get it done in 2021. Right. Well, and going back to what you're talking about, too, of of how you, you're not someone who is a contender for, for AOI. And you, I think that speaks to your your mindset of going out and which is why you're staying with the opens and you left FLW because the style of fishing is because you go for the biggest five bites that you can get throughout the day. And naturally, if you're going swinging, right, for to get those five bigger fish, that's not always going to pan out versus the guy who's going for, you know, to get his limit, to make the check, to try to get in that, you know, that top 40, top 30. Right. So that you could be in contention for ALI. You're going for looking for the biggest fish, that biggest bag you can catch that day. Am I correct in saying that? Yeah. And it, 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 it's really, com it's a lot more complicated than just saying swinging because. Right. Look, dude, I've, I've tried to change this through the years to make my AOI points better. Um, it's 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 just something that's just naturally in me. It's my style of fishing, my style of fishing, what I'm attracted to, what what I'm attracted to in practice, the bites that I'm attracted to, what what pulls me inward, what when I'm listening to my gut nine times out of ten, even though I may not think of it as being a home run ball, it it kind of is. It, you know, it's just it's just what what I'm attracted to. Um, I'm a very versatile fisherman. Um, I can do it all. Um, and I, I, I've, I've almost been so versatile to a point throughout my career. I look back, it's been detrimental to my career because there have been tournaments that go by that what went down the top 10 was my wheelhouse and I wasn't there doing it because I was off doing something, you know, with a spinning rod or, or something else. And, and early in my career, it cost me tremendously because it would cost me, you know, even getting paid. Like I would finish 100 and something and the top 10 would be up on the bank with a flipping stick. I can think of one up there in New York and Oneida. And then we backed it up to Champlain in 2006, back to back. That's how both those tournaments went down. And both tournaments, I went to New York and I'd never been there before in my entire life. All I knew was about smallmouth or all I heard about. And so, you know, I, I didn't do well in either event. And I did it with a spinning rod primarily. And uh, I had no business doing that, you know. Uh, Tommy Biffle won Oneida, and uh, Denny Breyer won Champlain. So um, those were big learning lessons for me, but I still make them to this day where sometimes it costs me. But now what I see happening is, is that I've come so far along. Um, we were in Texas this year, and I had no idea that those willow trees existed in that open that we were down there on Lake Louisville that a lot of the guys caught them out of. Um, I still cashed a check and still ground out a decent finish with a spinner rod in my hand, even though I wasn't on the juice, if that makes sense. So like, yes, I make some wrong mistakes, but like, I'm not always swinging for it. But like I say, what attracts me sometimes is like, if I get a big bite early in practice, it just sometimes it'll take me down that rabbit hole that a lot of guys are like, Hey, that was just one bite. And they're smart enough to go away from it. And I'm not. <clears throat> no. <laughs> Pick up that big stick and run with it. I love yes. fishing that way. It's so much fun. Right. Yeah. And so I know you said, obviously, you know, you mentioned how it could be like a one to three year deal, right? Trying to qualify for the leads. Yeah. And you're, you weren't expecting, you know, to qualify in your first year. But, you know, looking back on the season, though, if you were to kind of name, you know, one thing you think, you know, you're proud of, you know, one to, maybe it's a good decision you made throughout a tournament or maybe. You know, one, one aspect you think that you were really strong in throughout your 2020 open season. And then on the flip side, one thing that you think you did not so well and that you need to improve going into 2021. Um, something that I was proud of, I was just proud of my maturity and my experience primarily, I guess, through the travel. Like I never got excited. I never got burned out. I knew what the grind was on the back to backs. I was able to roll from one to the next. I was able to follow up some bad days in tournaments. I kind of, when I got in that role where I started cashing checks, um, first day of the tournament, I would be in the hundredth place or worse. And I was able to 
go back out there on day two, you know, re regroup and compose myself to be able to go out and have a really, really good day two to come back. Um, that all comes from, you know, doing this a long time and understanding what you're up against and, you know, the, the nature of the beast. Um, I, I think that some things that I could do to improve, I look back at some of those day ones, some of those events, I'm trying to do too much. I'm, uh, I've got four or five things going on that I found in practice and I want to do them all in the first hour of the tournament. You know what I mean? And when I look back after those tournaments are over and I, I had recovered and, and come back on the second day, all I did primarily on the second day was, was quit running around the lake with chicken like my head cut off and going into one area and going, all right, what have I got to do to make these fish right here bite? You know, and then maybe if they don't bite, then you take your time and you go just somewhere close that's that you've got and you try to figure out how to get something to bite there. And then one bite, Kind of will kind of lead you to bite number two, possibly lead you to bite number three. And if if I had one thing learned going into 2021, that would be that would be a big part of it. Um, I don't think I really allowed myself enough time to practice. Um, this is different for everyone, you know. I, I spent so long with just three official practice days and an off limits period that that's basically what I did in the opens, even though we don't have an off limits period. And for guys like Brian New, he's a good friend of mine. You know, he just won the points. It works for him, and, and he that's that's his machine. I think for myself, next year I probably will allow a couple more days. Um, a good example is Lake Louisville. It was a small lake. I knew it was a lot of pressure. I knew that that lake had the potential of that shallow end and that shallow bite, but quite honestly, the lake was so small and the field was so big, I thought those guys would just beat it to death to where it wouldn't play. And – a couple more days of practice, I would have at least drove up there and looked at it. And like I said, that kind of bite attracts me anyway, so I wouldn't have really been able to say no to it. Um, it's, it's hard driving home, guys, on a tournament. Even like that one where I got a check and had a decent finish, I still got to get in my truck Saturday morning, and I'm driving, so you know what I'm doing. I'm turning on live coverage right on my phone while I'm driving, and there those guys are in the middle of those willow trees, and I'm like, oh. Dang, gum it. <laughs> it's like taking a knife and sticking it in your heart, and then you pull it out, and then you stick it in, and you pull it out. <laughs> well, when you go back and think of, like, the live thing, it's such a great learning experience for us to almost go back and reflect now for, like, the touring anglers. You can see possibly what you miss, and even though you already have all this experience, you can be like, wow, I can't believe I missed that. Or in your case, maybe if I practiced one more day, I would have caught on to that. Right. And move forward. So now if you go back to Lake Louisville at the same time of year, you're like, oh, I got to check shallow now at least one of these days mm -hmm. to make sure it's mm -hmm. ready to go. Yeah. So, I mean, live is really opening up opportunities for anglers to realize it's almost like if you're a football fan, as you are, um, you can go back and watch the replay of other games that were filmed and make a game plan off of that in the future. Yeah, we're really fortunate to have live. I know live was a big success for Bass and the Opens this year, and they're going to have it next year. It's also a big success for guys like me that are trying to sell sponsorships, you know, while being on the Opens, mm -hmm. on, you know, a quote, quote, national tour. Um, it, it's a really big deal. And, and I know live was a big success. There was there was a lot of eyeballs on the Bassmaster Opens this year just because of all the guys that were kind of grouped up there that hadn't been grouped up before, fishing against each other along with some of the best locals, the best regional fishermen, and, and best young guys trying to get into the sport. So um, it's an interesting place, and it will continue to be that way for the next three to four years going forward for sure. Yeah. I think, you know, and adding on to that is – you know, looking at this year with the elites, right, in the fall season, obviously, you know, the amount of opens that were in the fall, too, and seeing how it, it was a struggle for a lot of people, having that live there, I think, was really beneficial for anglers that, you know, are serious about it enough to really pay attention to it, to see, you know, that they aren't watching it to watch, you know, the slugfest. They're watching it to see what it is a grind. They're seeing what are these anglers doing to make adjustments. You know, when times do get tough, what are they doing to try to therefore go find a bite? If maybe their area or their pattern or their bait selection isn't working, what are they doing differently to try to trigger something else? I think that's what's super cool about live, like Andy was saying, for us anglers, is a huge learning tool. It is. And, it, and like, like you guys said, I mean, it's been a huge learning tool for the pros for many years because, I mean – you know, look, you know, like on that FLW tour, there's been 160, 170 guys, and there's only 20 of them fishing on Saturday out of that 170. So 
you always want to turn it on and learn and see what the leaders are doing on day three and day four, those four day events to realize what you missed. It's always been a big learning opportunity for everyone. And it's amazing how many times you go, damn, I was just right there and I didn't see it. Or damn, I thought that could be an option. Usually it's you're driving home and there's a bite. You had a bite somewhere, whether it be in practice or in the tournament that showed you that light and you almost thought about it, but you just didn't clue all the way in, put all the pieces together. But usually there was some clue somewhere that you missed that you can see throughout your week that you spent there, that you missed. It didn't lead you to that. Right. hundred percent. I think a lot of people can kind of relate to that too. Like whether it be an open or an elite series event, mm-hmm. MLS, whatever it is, even on a local trail where it's like, maybe you're talking to your buddy who maybe won the event and maybe you just missed money or whatever. You asked right. how he caught him or however, you know, whatever you're talking about. And he tells you like, oh, man, I was just thinking about doing that, too. And like like you mentioned earlier, it's like sticking a, a knife right in, right in the chest. <laughs> it's like, dang, but I mean, no for next time. Maybe maybe you do give that a chance. Maybe you do have a gut feeling that you this time, you know, next time you, you know, you actually take a chance on that gut feeling rather than sticking to what you know might make sense textbook wise. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. But, uh, but real quick, going back on football. Uh, we have a bunch of questions coming in on the question board. And I know you were on uh, Rich Lindgren's uh, Hella Bass's uh, show this past week, and he asked if you'd let him make an OU visor for you because Rich is known for his uh, his visor creations. Yeah, hell yeah, I'll wear one. Absolutely. <laughs> there you go, Rich. <laughs> Get him an OU visor. All right. I, I can't do the visors. I don't I don't know how Rich does it. I gave him props. I, I couldn't do a visor. See, the trick with the visor is you need some flow. I think I could pull off a visor pretty well in the summertime. You got the wild to the top. I'll show you boys some flow. That's like here. asking for almost like skin cancer right there. That's that's danger territory, Brad. Yeah. That's I'm, I'm, I'm on the way. I'm on the way. I'm on the way. Believe it or not, so am I. <laughs> I just let yeah, it grow. You're always going back each and every week. Heck yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, if you get as old as me, you won't care. It doesn't matter. <laughs> Whatever. It's, well, what, when you're in fish, you know, when you can wear a hat every day, it doesn't matter. You're not going into an office or anything. That's the crazy thing. I've worn a hat my entire life. So, like, I mean, even when I was a teenager, like, they would let us, you know, back then, we could wear hats to school and stuff. And, um, right. I wore a hat every day. About, from, like, seventh grade, sixth grade on, I had a baseball cap on my head my entire life. It's like I, I almost feel like I'm I'm naked, like I don't have one. You know the dream that you have? Uh, we all have it. Like you've had the dream where like you don't have any clothes on, but yet you're out in yeah. public. That's <laughs> how I feel with no hat on. And I've been that way my whole life. So, you know. I've been I'm the same way. I'm way more comfortable in a hat than without a hat. Yeah. I'm pretty sure my wife laughs at me because like as soon as I get dressed in the morning, first thing that goes on my head after the clothes is a hat. It's like 5 45 in the morning. I got my hat on. <laughs> like, yeah. go. it, it, doesn't matter. it doesn't matter if I have an office job, an outside job, like I want a ball cap on my head. I just I always have. Yeah. It's just a comfortability thing. I, I, I don't yeah. know. Yeah. I'm I'm kind of I don't know about you guys, but I'm kind of the same way with like wristbands or watches. Like I feel more comfortable if I have something on my wrists. I don't know. Maybe it's just because I wore like that. I was I was that kid that always had like the Live Strong, the yellow bracelet growing yeah. up with that sports yeah. band. I don't know. It was one of those things. But uh, J Rod here asked as well, and I think we we might know the answer to this one. But uh, which open event you're looking forward to most in 2021? Guys, there's a lot of them. I know everybody looks at that. You know that knows me very well knows that 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 I do like anything inside Oklahoma. Um, and Grand Lake is on that schedule. I think what I enjoy most about Grand being on the schedule is that it's the last event of the year. Because like I told you guys, you know, going into the end of this year, I had a shot mathematically. I had to make a top five or top ten. But like, give me that same shot and put me on Grand, and I like my odds better than, you know, somewhere in southern Alabama. But uh, there's a lot of lakes that I like. Um, I'm excited to go to Florida. Uh, Harris Chain is, is a lake that – I've seen opportunities to have an opportunity to win there before. They didn't come true, but um, I like it. Um, I like Smith Lake in Alabama is a good lake. I like Pickwick. Uh, Onada's on the schedule, correct? Some of the stuff up north. You guys ran the northern schedule down for me. You got two New York lakes. Yeah, it's it's James River, Onada, St. Lawrence. Yeah, I've never been to St. Lawrence. Um, I enjoy going places I've never been to before. I generally have good tournaments there. 
um, on places that I have not been to, um, sometimes even win. So I'm excited about that. Um, I, I do like Oneida. I know a lot's changed since I've been to Oneida. You know, like I say, I was there in 2006. And um, a lot of back, <clears throat> back then, but the locals didn't realize what was there. They really didn't. You know, you guys had tournaments up there, and they were like, yeah, well, the small mount's the main player, and blah, blah, blah. There, there were so many large mount in that place. They just didn't know how shallow and stupid they were. Um, but I know that's not the case now because then once it was shown to the world what was there, then they, you know, there wasn't that I many. I mean, blew those trees up, I'll tell you what. Right, right, right. And, and the canals, you know, we went back and Rojas won out of the river and, like, um, that all got pressurized and it's a lot different place now. So um, I get that, but I still want to go back. Um, I do like that place. I do think it's a small venue for the size of fields that we have, but I'm hoping – I'm hoping, but I, this is probably a bad hope, but I'm hoping the field sizes are a little bit smaller just because of the fact that we have three divisions now instead of two. But right. I don't know if that will happen. Yeah, that'll be interesting. We were, we were talking about the same thing kind of along the lines of Oneida with, with Pangrak last week, and that was one thing we talked about too is, I mean, Andy and I being from New York, we don't know an Oneida or seen Oneida with 200 boats. I mean, that's – like we said, like people people say it's one of the biggest lakes in New York, but in reality, it's not. I mean, it's, it's actually not. quite a small body of water if you really mm -hmm. think about fishable water. But uh, it's it's going to be interesting to see that. I mean, I, I'm doing that as a co-angler, the northern, so that's going to be an interesting sight to see for me uh, on on Oneida, seeing looking around and seeing what it actually looks like with 200 boats if that is what they allow on that lake. It's gonna, right. Well, the northern uh, schedule is a great schedule for co-anglers to fish um, because yeah, you could yeah. catch fish. 360 degrees of the boat. Most places like Oneida, you can, and you'll obviously be able to at the St. Lawrence. And then the James River's got, you know, grass and stuff like that. I'm, I'm, I'm speculating it does. Uh, the James River deal will really come up. I've got a really good friend of mine that I, I ran with three or four years, uh, Brian Schmidt, that's already on the Elite Series. And I haven't talked to him. I've got my fingers crossed that he's not fishing the opens. But with Oneida being on the schedule and the James River, he probably get greedy and do it. But if he doesn't, <laughs> I'll have him hammered down for info. He's about as strong of a tidal river fisherman as there is on the East Coast. He's uh, he's King Kong on Potomac. Oh, yeah. We, we've had Brian on and had a long conversation of the Potomac with him. That was actually a really fun show talking about, you know, swim jig fishing, grass on the Potomac. It was That was a really good one. Um, but like you said, too, like on the northern schedule as a co-angler, I mean, you look at the St. Lawrence River, and depending on that boat positioning, I mean, I think either way, as a co-angler, on the St. Lawrence River or like a like a Lake Erie. I mean, it's it's the best place to be a co-angler because I Absolutely. think depending yeah. on your, your drift too on at the St. Lawrence River, I mean, a co-angler has the advantage because you're some in, in some cases, depending on how they're positioning the boat, you're, the co-angler is the first one to reach the fish. Yeah, it's it's, it's it's super interesting how that all works. But uh, I think it's I think you're having a like you said, exploring new water, you're going to have a lot of fun. St. Lawrence mm -hmm. is a beautiful country to fish in. So it's going to be a lot of fun there. Um, but I know Andrew and I had some questions for you, you know, regarding shallow water fishing. I know Andrew had some some juicy ones, so I'll let him start. Yeah. With him. So I'm, I'm going to come right off the bat. I know you're – we all know you're a diehard flipper. Mm -hmm. so are you a braid guy, a braid a fluoro guy, or a fluoro guy? I am a braid guy. I am a heavy floral guy. I am not a braid to floral guy. Um, I just yeah, some situations where you do both, like where you would use the braid and where you'd use the floral. Yeah, so they're they're totally different situations. So um, Florida, Okeechobee, vegetation, Sam Rayburn, Texas, um, Sam Rayburn bushes, even though they're bushes. Rayburn has too many nine, eight, nine, ten pounders swimming around in the spring. And if you flip in there with 25 pound fluorocarbon, you can get broke off. Um, at Grand Lake, flipping willow trees, Champlain flipping trees, um, I'm going to flip fluorocarbon. Um, I like flipping fluorocarbon. Fluorocarbon to me, like when we're flipping wood, is less maintenance throughout the day in and out, whereas braid gets hung up in the the bark and stuff, you know how it catches and it just drives mm -hmm. me crazy. It just like dives, digs into it when you yeah, look at it. Yeah, it just stays hung up and I, I, don't, I don't like it. And quite frankly, I don't need it. Um, I'm not saying that I haven't broke fish off with 25 pound, but this started many years ago when we were flipping 25 pound mono, big game. Um, 
it's big enough. And, you know, now I flip 25 pound sunline and it, it's more abrasion, abrasion resistant than the mono was. I don't have many issues. And like I say, for the efficiency throughout the day of not getting hung up, it's, it's just what I like. I have a different rod set up and a different, everything's different for my wood flipping, but my braid flipping is a totally different rod, different setup there as well. But I do flip both. <clears throat> I have not been able, I, there's just something about that knot between me and a fish. Um, because I guess I could flip braid in bushes if I put a fluorocarbon leader on. But dude, my hook set, like, I, it's hard. Like I hit them and I, and I slack line them too. I'm a slack liner with fluorocarbon. And I mean, I, yep, and I, mean I'm not, I'm not, I knocked their head off. And uh, I think that that not, dude, I'm telling you, I, I would, there, there's no way I wouldn't at some point have problems with that. Like I, I just can't do it. I know that Edwin and I talked about this years ago when he was, he was flipping the, he was doing that. And, and I just, I just can't do it. I can't do it. Um, I know that Jason Christie and I've talked about it. He's the same as me. He can't do it. He either flips braid or he flips fluorocarbon. And he also feels the same way as I do. But we came from the same area where we were flipping the same willow trees and bushes here in Oklahoma. Um, so if I'm flipping bushes and I'm flipping wood nine times out of 10, I'm flipping fluorocarbon. The only way that I get away from that is if I'm somewhere in South Texas, somewhere where there's great big fish, well, maybe out in California even possibly. But if I'm somewhere where there's seven pounders regularly, the potential, then you, you just, you really got to be careful with, with 25 pound fluorocarbon. If five pounders with the occasional, hey, I might catch a six today, um, you can usually get by with 25. Hmm. That's interesting. Okay. I, I do think a lot of it is relative to the, like you mentioned, to the region that you're from. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, you know, for, for somebody like yourself or like a northern angler, I mean, a lot of times when you're fishing, you know, we don't have too many areas around here up in, the, in New York, at least where there's, you know, there's matted grass. So you, there isn't a lot of opportunities where maybe more down South where you have those opportunities, like, like in Alabama, where every lake, it seems, you know, in Alabama has some sort of matted vegetation, mm -hmm. where we don't really get to, to flip a lot of braid. I mean, we do have grass here. Obviously everyone, everyone's seen it featured on like a Champlain uh, and, so there's guys who do flip the braid, but I think the majority of you know, a lot of us are floral guys. But you do, now you're seeing a kind of a mix, and I've seen it kind of out of the Midwest too, of guys that are mix a lot more guys mixing in the the braid with an FD knot to a four carbon meter. And I think it's I think it's very region oriented. And so I see you see guys from Florida, that southeastern region, come up and start flipping around here with braid, seeing that it still works. And I think you are seeing guys kind of phase into more of a braid you know obviously if you're not in a wood sort of scenario but. what i think where, where, where it really changes and this is like one of my really good friends is todd castle dying down at rayburn in texas and for every rod that he likes for a presentation just about every rod we talk about this on like hook set stuff stuff that you'd be dragging or whatever even cranking mm -hmm. every rod that he has because we both throw falcons his preference is one notch up than mine like on everything his Carolina rig rod, his flipping rod, it's one power heavier than the rod that I go. You ask me, hey, what's the perfect rod for this? And I tell you, hey, this is a seven footer with, you know, it's a six power. He's going to tell you, hey, it's a seven foot two that's a seven power. Hmm. The difference is, is that he's from Rayburn and it's all grass. And where I'm from in Oklahoma, Grand is hardcover. And hardcover can be rocks, wood, docks, anything that's hard. It doesn't give and we've had these conversations and dude, I guarantee you that's what it is. It's the difference in the cover. So when he sets the hook on a fish, he's got grass between him and the fish. And so he needs something stiffer because, you know, the grass gives and creates that loop in your line. Whereas where we're at and where you guys are at, the loop primarily is some type of hard cover and it doesn't give. So you need something to give at that point. And that's the difference in the rods. Mm -hmm. That's super interesting. Yeah, and, that, and that's kind of, Andy, what we've been really heavily discussing in the past oh, yeah. couple of weeks is rods and rod actions and going back and forth. That's the biggest argument that me and Andy have had in the past the couple The biggest weeks. one is a chatterbait on what rod to use. Bailey is like a stiff, extra fast, fast guy, and I like that 
moderate, fast, almost glass composite action when I chatterbait fish. I think it's way more efficient in sparse grass, even like shallow around docks, than that straight, like extra fast, medium heavy, heavy action graphite rod. I just feel like I lose way less fish that way. And, I, and I'll use 17 or 20 pound flora with it as well. So I, mm -hmm. I'm not afraid of them coming off. I can hit them with the hammer. <laughs> Most, most, guys, most guys are with Andy. Um, the stiffer rods for the chatterbait, you tend to blow, pull it away from a fish. A lot of if, if it's on that softer rod, it, it they seem to get the bait better every time and get it deeper. Um, I do know what you're saying, Bailey, because I originally, when the chatterbait first came out, wanted to throw it on the same rod that I threw a spinnerbait on. But right. that that spinnerbait, it's two different baits and. Um, there's no doubt that the rod with, with a little more flex is better. I, I, I can't go all the way to the fiberglass composite, but, um, I definitely have, it's a set, it's a longer rod. It's like seven foot four, but it is a immediate to moderate action rod with a really, really soft tip. So like the, the top foot of that rod is, is pretty dang light. Now it does stiffen up after that, but, um, it's a rod that some guys might even consider a cranking rod, just like what Andy's talking about. Yeah. And that's what I'm. What Andy has actually convinced me. So I, he's told me, you know, talking about using these composite or these glass rods for it, and we, we we go back and forth on it. So I I decided to to take the leap of of trying out you know a more, a actual glass rod. I, I went and bought uh, it's a Daiwa Type H. It's a seven three. It's a seven three heavy moderate glass rod. But I'm gonna give a shot to Frank and see how that works out and see what I like. So the specs on that rod are identical to the old Hercules Leopold Evergreen rod that Brett Height used when yeah. Chatterbait first exploded. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. literally the identical rod specs all the way through. And I was like, Bailey, if you want to get into glass rod fishing with the Chatterbait, try this rod because you're not going to change once you do it. And so Beehive is kind of obviously the, the leader of this whole driven uh, – chatterbait deal and he's made more money with it than anybody um what i realized is, is that we're still all of us are different anglers and mm -hmm. even though what works for me high doesn't necessarily work for me because first of all most of b heights wins and most of the money b Height makes on that bait and he may come on here and go home and that's not necessarily true it probably isn't as much as he throws it but it is generally offshore situations when, when beehives dominate, and he's generally on an offshore aquatic vegetation type situation, um, when I'm generally catching them really good with it, it's usually on the bank. And I'm usually around wood, some type of hard cover, not grass. See, so we're kind of going back to the same thing, mm -hmm. right? So in this case, I like a little bit stiffer rod because I need to pull fish away from the cover a little bit more. Whereas if I was with just the total glass cranking rod i don't have as much power after that hook set to get the fish away from the cover makes sense definitely it's it's such an interesting argument to you know it, to it's situational down. yeah it is yeah. fishing dude everything is situational we're, we're I'm, I'm learning that the older i get the more i do it how much i mean even like safety procedures i mean everything is situational like everything yeah no 100 percent. and so going back you know back to shallow water it's you know one of my questions for you uh was you know when you when you approach say practice right and you know you're going to be you know, on the bank or, or in shallow water what are what are the first factors you're looking for in not just areas you think that are going to be high percentage but you think are going to be prospective areas that you just want to start practicing on what are what are the first signs that you're looking for time of year obviously a seasonal pattern you know, what's the time of year allowed? Is it allowed for, are we pre-spawn, are we spawn, are we post-spawn? That's the first thing. And then the second thing I'm looking for is probably going to be where are the tributaries that lead into it. Where you guys live, it's a little bit different because it changes. You guys live on natural lakes. And so the way that we break down seasonal patterns and fish and the way that I learn to find fish and track fish is primarily based off of creek channels. They use them like highways. And... I don't get very far off of that channel. Now that channel could be in the back of a flat and we're only talking about a one foot depression, but that one foot depression is, is a big deal in a two foot deep flat. Um, with natural lakes, like where you guys live, it's a little bit different. 
but you guys still have canals and different things and, and current uh, driven by wind and different things that position fish. So with natural lakes, I've learned some of the things to look for. I mean, it's the same thing in Florida too. So that's why the Florida guys do really well. A lot of times where you guys live is because the two lakes are quite honestly a lot alike. But um, I would say that I've, I've lost train of thought of where we were headed, the things I'm looking for. So those, so seasonal patterns, seasonal movement of fish, the time of year we are. Then, then one of the main things I'm looking for fishing shallow is water color. What, what's going to allow me to fish as shallow as I would want to fish? Which, once again, uh, where you guys live, uh, completely a uh, huge learning lesson there too, because no matter how clear it is, those stupid things still live extremely shallow where you guys live. Like, yeah, you can see good. bottom, I come off pad, <laughs> half a mile from the bank, a half a mile, and it is only six foot deep. And then you idle for a half a mile to the bank, and there is no cover, there is no grass, there is nothing. It's just, the, it's like the damn moon. You come all the way to the bank, and then you get to the bank, and it's a foot deep, and you put your trolling motor down, and you go, it's like bath water, and it's July. And then you go down the bank, and there's only one dock on the whole bank, and you guys call them docks. They're really more like uh, what painters use, you know, scaffolding. Whenever they, yeah. they stack scaffolding, that's basically what y'all's docks are, just a little narrow piece of scaffold going out into the water. And there's just a little bitty shade line, but yet – 20 pounds will live underneath that scaffold. <laughs> it's just the most amazing thing I've ever seen. But uh, Stupid yeah, New York ass. <laughs> man, they're crazy. Well, actually, I learned to love that fact, you know. I mean, it's cool. That, but watercolor is still a big deal. So, like, if I'm looking for a big population of fish, anything that's got a little bit more color to it tends to allow all of them to come in easier. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, I think that's more of a summertime deal, what I'm talking about in that crystal clear water where you guys see, and I'm sure they do it in spring too. Yeah, um, yeah watercolor tends to hold more fish. So like if we're talking on, on a national deal here, um, watercolor is big because watercolor will allow, it'll allow them all to come and all be within three foot or less. Mm. So watercolor is a big deal. Um, even in Florida, watercolor is a big deal because it's the water clarity of how clear it is. And I'm sure your guys' natural lakes are a lot like Florida. The clearer water is where they tend to be. No, not the case. Oh, I mean, I think our water is probably clearer than Florida, so we're like ultra clear. Right, but I'm just saying to the to the bass around the spawn, do they prefer the clearer water areas, or do they prefer they don't mind a stain? They'll get in and do the stain uh, too. They won't mind a stain at all. It's pretty much the first areas that are going to have uh, and warm enough warm water. First. Yeah, it's going to get warm first. So I guess you can kind of follow where that warmer water is going to be, especially with the glacial lakes. You know, it'll start north, and, like, as the weeks go on, the spawn moves south, mm -hmm. uh, which is extremely interesting because it's like Champlain is the complete opposite. I mean, Champlain, it works south to north. I think it's, it's because Champlain is so much bigger. So, like, if you're talking about the glacier lakes, you're talking about, like, the Finger Lakes and stuff. Yeah. Uh, I can definitely see where the north end, because just the way, you know, the north end warms up quicker. But Champlain is just so big that, mm -hmm. you know – the south end's got to warm up better because you're talking about 200 miles from there to the north, you know? Yeah. yeah. But, yeah, I mean, it doesn't really matter for us up here, water clarity. I mean, it's if it has the water temperature and, and it feels right for them, they'll move it. It doesn't matter if it's mud brown or if it's crystal clear. As long as That's it has cool. the right temperature, yeah, they, they don't really care. But, I mean, for the, for speaking, majority of our Finger Lakes, if that's, you know, kind of the topic we're going on, unlike a Champlain that has a lot of, you know, creeks and channels and, <laughs> you know, different little – places you can kind of get out of the main lake. Right. Uh, the Finger Lakes don't really have a lot of it. They're pretty much just a, like they're, they're called the Finger Lakes for a reason. They don't really have much coming off of it. Besides, you know, a couple of different lakes that have, you know, a channel coming up north that connects to a kind of like a network of different lakes. But it's, right. it's, that, that's what I was getting about a seasonal pattern is kind of how, you know, we as in the most parts of the country learn how to trace and track and follow bass is by creek mm -hmm. channels. And then you guys don't have them at all. You know, most of your lakes are natural lakes. So that, that does away with that. So you, you've got to look for other other things. Yeah. The only lakes that I can really think of that are somewhat have like that seasonal pattern to them aren't like big tournament lakes. Like we have, we do have impoundment lakes in New York that have big, deep creek bed channels to them built mm -hmm. on like impoundments, but they're not big enough per se to hold national or large like hundred boat tournaments. Like maybe the 
Vegas to one in New York might be like Great Sakandaga in the Adirondacks. Like a lot of those bigger lakes in the mountains up there are actually impoundment lakes. They mm-hmm. have like creek beds and a lot of creeks that dump into them and channels. But other than that, the rest of them are deep natural lakes. Yeah. That's a really good topic to think about, especially how that changes throughout the region. You know, like, things that people look for, especially when it comes to spawn, what they need. Yeah, but there's all there's all different kinds of panels. I thought about doing a YouTube series on this because actually I've got some hella right here. Is he pulling out. Let me bring y'all into some knowledge, son. I'm talking <laughs> like knowledge. Uh-oh. You guys ever heard of Buck Perry? I don't think I have. So these are, now I haven't read these in 20 years, but um, I probably need to go back and study them a little bit. But um, this is Buck Perry's Guidelines for Fishing Success. He was a spoon plugger. You boys know what spoon plugging is. <laughs> Do you? Yeah. Do you know what spoon plugging is? Vaguely. Vaguely. So <laughs> it's a metal spoon that was built to dive, and you troll. They throw them out, and they trolled them behind the boat. And that's what this guy was. He was a troller. Can you imagine trolling for bass? But, dude, this guy was so smart. He figured out the seasonal pattern of fishing. He was basically offshore fishing is what he was doing. When guys thought 10 foot was, like, stupid, crazy deep, you know, he was out there when he trolled. So there's not many, for what it's worth, there's not many pro anglers out there, guys that have been doing this a while that know, know what's up. There's not one worth his grain of salt if he hasn't read Buck Perry's Guide at some point in his career. And I'm sure most of them read it when they were young. It's not something you see here talked a lot about, but the seasonal pattern bass movement, he wrote these books in like 70s, I believe. He had it nailed, guys. Like there were some things that, that, that he really thought was right that's not correct now. Like not every fish in the lake makes the same movement. And, you know, they don't go – hundreds of miles to go to their spawning area and then go hundreds of miles to come out here to their summer area. But the general idea of what he was teaching in these books was extremely correct. And to the point of what we were talking about to tie us all back in, he understood the difference of rivers, natural lakes, and man-made impoundment lakes, highland reservoirs, lowland reservoirs, and midland reservoirs, and how lowland, midland, and how they were different and how the fish related on them as well as how different they related on natural lakes, as well as they related different on rivers and tidal rivers. So those are really all the different types of waterways that we have get really complicated. And fish act the same on a tidal river system being in Potomac as they do on the West Coast at the California Delta. They have similarities, extreme similarities. Same as natural lakes in Florida have extreme similarities to the ones that you guys have in New York. Now, where can somebody get their hand? Are those still available? Can you get those anywhere? They're called Buck Perry's Home Study Series, and I have no idea where you get them. Probably those. Amazon. Somebody's got to have them on Amazon. <laughs> yeah, there's like a there's a volume seven in my hand, so there's seven or eight books to it. And uh, like I said, I went and dug these out because I was wanting to do my next YouTube series on this and uh, talk about some of the things that Buck taught and then some of the things that we see that are different now. Um, because like for, for the guys that I've got that, that watch my YouTube channel, they're really, really into bass fishing. I've got a pretty hardcore group of guys that, that follow my stuff. Um, this can really improve your learning curve. But this is not something you're going to find on the Internet, read about on some YouTube YouTuber's channel because the YouTuber's just spitting out verbatim what he's heard from some other buddy or something he's read, but it, it hadn't been from here. We got a guy who found the website. Yeah, there you go. We can get him then. <laughs> Thank you, Nicholas Belch. So tell us where can we find him? Yeah, buckspoonplugs.com apparently. I'll have to give that a look here after, but yeah, if you come up north and those, uh, if you bring them with you while you fish and those all of a sudden go missing, I didn't do it. We went to Office Max and made a copy real quick. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I will promise that if you read Buck Perry at some point, you're going to get tired of reading about spoon plugging. But it's the general idea. That's what you got to focus on. It's like the depths and where he was catching fish and the seasonal patterns that he was putting together was, quite frankly, incredible. I mean, it, it really was incredible what he was doing. He was traveling around the country doing this. He wasn't just sitting in some one lake in Tennessee doing it. I mean, he went all over. 
Smart, smart guy. That's that's so interesting. I've never – Andy, have you ever heard about those before? No, I've no, I it. haven't. I mean, the biggest book I know of was uh, in the New York State. We had a guy named Sanders. I can't – I don't even know his first name, but it was Sanders Fishing Guy. And he literally would write like a page and a half summary of every body of water from lakes to streams. There was two volumes. And he would tell you like – what baits to use, when, where, and why. And like when the spawn would pull up on the, like when bass would pull up on the spawn or when the crappie would be on the spawn. <laughs> Those are really cool. They're like 400 pages each. You can't get them anymore unless you want to pay like 90 to $200 for them. But yeah, they're, they're real interesting. I learned a lot of my hiking and fishing spots from reading those books on these tiny creeks. And it's like, well, I would have never thought to go there, but he exposed everything. Nick, uh, Nick had another comment here as well. We're talking about fishing with spoons, and I think it depends on what kind of spoon you're talking about. If you're talking about bigger spoons, they yes, I've tried implementing them, but I think for us, Andy, at least up here in the north, you know, spoons are mo mostly like smaller versions, and you're using them, you know, when it's water is really cold, like almost in place of like a blade bait, but. Mm -hmm. I mean, very situational based. Yeah, but down by you in Oklahoma, are, do spoons play a part? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, it's a wet, it depends on what type of spoons we're talking about, but we can catch them on the big, massive spoons in the summertime. Um, spoon jacking, as uh, James Watson calls it, um, that that works here in the summer as well. And then in the wintertime, we catch them on the smaller, the three quarter ounce and five eighths ounce, um, half ounce spoons. Um, here in Oklahoma, I just Almost came like back from Table Rock. Hammered War Eagle ones, those real little ones. Yeah, I just came back from Table Rock. We were up there a couple weeks ago before Christmas and uh, caught them really good in like stupid deep, dude, like 65, 75 foot of water. Caught them really good. Caught them on a spoon. I think the proper terminology for those little lead spoons is like a, a stamped spoon, if I remember correctly, right? They're, they're like yeah. stamped in the press. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. believe is how they're made. Mm hmm. That's so interesting. Yeah, I remember. I think it was a Wired to Fish episode with with uh, with James Watson when he was flipping uh, deep marina docks with a spoon, and that that was, that was super interesting. Because that's like we don't have, we can't do that up here. We don't have any any lake that we can do that. No, your marinas don't hang over. Let me think. First of all, most marinas you guys can't fish because no. they don't let you. I'm well, only in big tournaments they don't really let you. You can sneak into them if you're fun fishing. <laughs> Man, that's, you're talking about laws that we need to get changed in the world like that's just, one of them they're, they're building we've got one here in Oklahoma, southern oklahoma that they're building another marina and it's a little lake to begin with and there's two marinas and they don't allow you to fish in those marinas not even fun fishing and uh, they have big wars and knockouts and now i just noticed that they're a red where they're building a new one a giant one and, you know, I mean, if these marinas want to own the water and the fish, that this is what they need to do. This is what our judges and everyone needs to realize. It's fine for them to have a private marina. The dock and the boat on it, I 100 percent agree that it's their property mm -hmm. because they, they rent them from the Corps or TVA or whoever owns the waterway. But the bottom of the land, the but water. The water, the water and the fish that swim in it and the land that it's on, they don't own. If they if they want to own all that, then they should go buy. You know, let's take Oneida, for example. If, if they want to own that, to have that body of water, then they should go buy the 280,000 acres of land in New York, maybe 600,000 acres. I don't know what it would be. Build a gate, go down there, build a dam, dam up there. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And then they can build their marina down there and then hell, it's private. But until then, all that is is public land and public water. And I don't understand how they claim that. You know, you know what I'm saying? And yeah. it's... It's it's a big burden. The problem is is that the group of us as fishermen are primarily fishermen, and we're plumbers and we're electricians and we're this and we're that. And the problem is is that those marina owners are filled with doctors and lawyers, and they've got the money, they've got the White expensive power. boats, damn right. And that's what it is. And so they are taking over public property mm -hmm. with their influence to create laws. And quite honestly. If we fight it and fight it, which this will continue to fight, we'll see it with YouTube and things. People, we're going to lose the battle, even though that we're in the right because of what I just said. 
they're the ones with the money and the influence and they will make sure that the laws are done and drawn up their way and they will win the battle on that. I know that um, I've talked to a lot of people here in Oklahoma that have got some stroke in the Oklahoma Wildlife Department and they've told me, it's like, Hallman, you know, because I've been like, hey, I can push this. Like, I can do it. You want me to push it? I'll be the one to push it. And they're like, man, we're afraid to push it because all it's going to take is one judge to set precedent and then the rest can follow behind. Yeah. And they're afraid what that precedent will be. Does that make sense? That's yeah. coming from the Wildlife Department of Oklahoma. That's crazy. Mm -hmm. yeah. I know the ones up here, like if they're man-made, I believe the term is, Andy, correct me if I'm wrong. If it's man-made, you're not allowed to be inside of it. But if it's a natural marina, you're allowed inside of it, which mm -hmm. still doesn't stop them from trying to tell you that you're not allowed in there. And and it's, it's very well, difficult to distinguish because the rules say man-made outside of the natural footprint of the lake. So, like, if the glacier yeah. didn't make it and it's natural, you know, dug out. Which like some of them you can't really by tell. a corrugated wall or something or a jetty. Mm -hmm. it's, 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 a, it's a hard call, you know. Um but like I say, they're on a public waterway. So how can they be? We, I just wish they'd get rid of all of it because it should be should be allowed to go on all of it. But every state's different. I get that. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's probably one of the funkiest rules in New York, I think, is how we can't fish marinas. I know Onondaga even has one that I believe. Yep, can't go in at I, all. We'll kick you out if as soon as you pull your boat in there, even though the boat launch I think is in the marina or right next to it. Correct? Yeah. <laughs> I, I just you know it, it, it's a terrible thing that's going to happen to our fisheries, and you know I, I do think that we lose that battle. I really do, just because we're on the wrong end of the influencers. Um, I'm not saying that we don't have some of the right people, you know, in this sport. We do, but it, it won't be enough to overtake the people that have those really expensive boats and pay in those marinas to, you know, like where you guys live, they got to pull them out every year and winterize them right there in a heated, you know, some of that stuff in upstate New York and mm -hmm. they have like the heated houses. Y'all are shaking your head like this is normal. That shit ain't normal everywhere else. Like, <laughs> normal. The boats are still floating down here at my lake. Like, they would float there all winter. If those guys had to pay to pull them out and put them in a heated barn, they'd be out. Like that would be way too much uh, upkeep. Um, yeah, Andrew Hayes, a good buddy of ours, said uh, said in Southern Ohio, the marina is the only spot worth the darn in the whole lake. <laughs> yeah. Well, amazing enough, I don't know how it would be a fish in marinas. Andrew, let me know in the comments there. That'd be interesting. But yeah, I mean, there's so many ones that like. I mean, we have some marinas up here too that like you know during this that spring to you know late summer when you know your pleasure boaters as we call them are on the water. The marinas will kick you out all during out that, but like any other time of the year, they don't care if you're in there. I think it's just a, you know, like they're like you said, they're protecting the people with the money. Absolutely, they what's going on? Absolutely, they're protecting themselves from the people with the money, not yelling at us and getting sued <laughs> by the people with the money. So, and, and, and I, get it. you know, like I, I yeah. spent my life on the water, so I know that I have witnessed, and I know that there are people that are less experienced that are fishermen that are doing things in those marinas that would be aggravating. To, Bring. Uh, yeah <laughs> and not 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 even the the unsuccessful cash from time to time but like hanging up and breaking off and leaving hooks and top ropes you know the ropes yeah. that go to the big boats let's throw um, a 6xd between these two boats and catch so, so, so this is what i do know i know that like to step out on that dock is is private property that, that's how i feel and that's how the laws really are that right. is private property that is the part they own and if I'm practicing or fun fishing and I get a jig or something stuck in a rope, you know, that goes down from there up to the other boat, dude, I do my dangest, even if I've got to get on the dock. And I've actually been grabbed out before. They don't even understand what I'm trying to do. But I'm like, I'm trying to prevent, I don't care about the lure. I could care less. I'm trying to prevent someone coming down there tomorrow and going to untie their boat and they run their hand down that line and they put that hook through their hand. I mean, to me, that's the worst thing a fisherman could do is leave that yeah. lane there for them to be injured on later. And then, yeah, I would be pissed if I was that guy and I cared nothing about fishing. Why are they fishing in my stall? And I'd be mad at every fisherman coming by. Yeah. But um, just to trespass on somebody's dock, that's not cool. And I, and I think guys, you know, we're seeing the MLF guys have been doing that. You know, they make a TV show out of it, you know, where they get the penalty if they step off on the dock and I'm waiting for them to get fined or ticketed for it because what they're doing is trespassing. I mean, that is what they're doing. It's going to happen. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's not a good deal. I mean, it's not a good look. And I, I don't know if they thought of it that way, but that is what they're doing. They're trespassing. Yeah. And this is a this is an interesting concept. So you bring it up how 
you know, the, the worst thing for an angler to do is to, you know, say, leave that jig on that, on that dock line. Right. We have, we have one lake here in New York where I don't know if you've ever seen these before, but they're called weed mats. Oh, and the worst the worst grass mats. They're called, yeah. So they oh. call them weed mats. And basically what it is, is just this big carpet that people will put next to their docks. So or that when they're running, all around them. <laughs> yeah. So they're not swimming in grass, but basically they leave them out there year round. So if you're fishing in like early spring or late fall, when there's no docks in, they take their docks out. You're snagging on these things. And if you get a hook in it, like a, say a jerk bait or a crank bait, you're not getting it out unless you physically go in there and get it out. So they're like, they're hurting themselves because they're putting this man out there that's supposed to prevent grass from growing. But instead of getting grass in their feet, now they're getting hooks in the feet and they blame the anglers when, how are we supposed to know there's a, a reason? So it's like a piece of carpet, basically. That they're yeah, it's to lay literally on the it's like a 20 by 20 foot carpet that they just lay on the bottom with cinder blocks. Yeah, which keeps the grass growing so that they can swim and yeah. not have swimming in grass. I get that. Well, that's better than using pellets and chemicals like they do down here in the south. They just kill not only the grass by their dog, but the entire lake. Oh, well, they, they do, do that. that here too. <laughs> <laughs> like we get yeah. like the worst algae blooms you've ever seen in your life. Dead grass, like oh. the, the coontail, the milfoil, whatever else we have will be like this slimy green just junk from them poisoning it. And then You'll be there one day, and it'll be this green, beautiful, red-tipped grass. You go the next back the next day, all of a sudden it's slimy. You go back a week later, it's just gone. Well, back to what I told you guys. If they don't like it, then they should go buy the 680,000 acres that it takes to, to build yeah. a dam and back up their own lake. I mean, that's what they should do. <sighs> Make their own little swimming section. Let us mm-hmm. have it where it's, it's meant to be. Yeah, it's, it's such an interesting conversation, too, because it's – when you talk to people who are involved with the con- the conversation of it, you know the you know, like the DEC and different parties involved. It's it's very interesting to see what goes on behind the scenes. But I mean, the weed mats. I'll say there is one positive to this: is I'm the one kind of crazy dude where you know once the water gets somewhat safe to swim in, I'll spot a 110 down there on that mat. I'll go swimming to get a free 110. I'll replace the hooks. They don't matter. <laughs> Well, now that you bring up the grass mat, I, I'm thinking of some places in New York where that little, not necessarily a 20 by 20, but a four by five would be pretty good in the middle of a grass mat. Where like if you had your own planted out there, they'd be pretty yeah. good holes in the summer to be, you, you guys get my point here? Yeah. yeah. Which is interesting because they're allowed to put out these weed mats, but we're not allowed to put out any structure whatsoever. Yes. Can you, can you, that's what I'm saying. Can you put out weed mats? So maybe that's there we go, and maybe we found our, our loophole. Well, you know the places where the grass really flourishes and grows. Like if you have yeah. a couple of places that you put some little four by fives, like those fish would be in that hole. That'd be awesome. Yeah, make our own little spawning flat. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Not even a spawning flat, flat a flipping mat, <laughs> like flipping yeah, gear. It's just it has some fun. There's a business idea for you. Or just have the two by two by two foot cuts of, of rug and just sell them. To yeah, people. yeah. <laughs> Well, the grass just goes up all four walls all the way around all the way to the surface, but yeah, you still got this one cavity all the way down. And there you we go. could even get more like articulate with this. We could put like a big boulder in the middle of it and like sprinkle some gravel around to be like, we're just holding down our grass mat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they might they might not like the rock for you guys there. You can't put anything in the water, right? You guys can't use right. garage or anything. Oh no. yeah. People get tickets because they'll take their Christmas trees out there and dump mm-hmm. them in the lake and yeah, it's it's just it's very interesting to see how they run things, but for nonetheless, I mean, we, so, I mean, we've, we've talked about a lot of topics here. I mean, Andy, you got anything, anything left for Brad here tonight? I was going, I was cruising through your Instagram here a little bit. Why does it seem like a lot of diehard flippers are starting to use that big bite baits BFE? The, the, the best flipper ever. Yeah. Um, it's like a tube creature ring bait. It, it's cool looking. I haven't used it yet, but it looks it looks awesome. Yeah, it's really going to play come this spring. Um, we've sold a lot of them. Um, it's 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 got the best combinations of you know two or three baits that were out there for a long time. One, we flipped the tube first. That was a big bait. Then the beaver came along. We flipped that, and the brush hog somewhere in the middle. Um, that bait was designed 
to try to emulate some of the best baits that had ever been done, which doesn't have a whole lot of action. What action it does have is subtle, you know, whether it be a Senko or whether it be a beaver, or whether it be a tube. Um, I wanted that gliding action of a tube. It's a bait that I designed for Big Bite for you guys watching that don't know. Um, I wanted that gliding action of the tube, but yet I wanted the tail end to be more like, you know, the, the beavers and things like that, that we flip um, with a crawl action, but still different. It's not two pieces, um, but I just wanted a subtle action. You know, um, the Senko is a, a, a prime example. I think I carried that thing around on the boat for five years before I ever put it on and threw it. And then it probably took me another two years to understand why they were eating it, you know, and it was that really fine little little twitch of the tail as it sinks is really what includes those fish in. If you really look into some of the best plastic baits that have ever been designed, the, they do nothing. The, the subtleness of them is is what really the Ned, right? So the Ned head, um, those are the things that really get all of us a lot of bites. And that's really what I was looking for. That and you know, I wanted a bait that I could I could honestly take from coast to coast I wanted something that I could use with braid and flipping grass and mats like down in Florida at Okeechobee, but I also wanted to be able to flip in willow trees here in Oklahoma, uh, take up to New York and flip, whether I'm flipping willows and hardwood at Champlain or I'm down in Ticonderoga flipping grass. I wanted to be able to use it for both. And that's really what I designed that bait for, is to kind of be a 101 army issue flipping bait that would stay on the hook. And um, I could efficiently fish with it for a long period of time without having to change a bait out. Right. I'm sold. I'm a huge, I like a flipping tube and a Senko. So that's like my main mm -hmm. two things I always flip and they're just dead action, but you can do different things with them to get almost like a reaction bite when you flip. So I'm, I'm extremely intrigued. I haven't caught any yet, but I think I'm going to pick some up now. Well, if you think about it, nine times out of 10 on a flipping bite, when you flip in, when you pick up on your rod, it's there, right? She's yeah. got, it. or she, you know, she hits it on the way down and you feel it. Boom. There's like two important, two important times when you flip to get that bite. I feel like, and the big one is that first drop. Absolutely, yeah. Tyler Callaway here asks as well if, if you're using a four off flipping hook for the BFE. I use I use four off, so I designed that bait to be used with two or three different hooks because I've got some really good friends that are some of the best flippers in the world in Florida, and 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 I, I myself. I'm pretty experienced there as well myself, but they like to use a three-aught hook. The reason they like a three-aught hook is they want it very tight to that body because when they're punching extremely heavy mats, like when the wind's blowing or something, it's very hard to penetrate. Where a lot of guys aren't going down through that mat, theirs is falling. And that the reason why is that three-aught hook because it just makes the bait so compact, you know. Um, so I designed that bait to be able to hold a three-aught all the way up to a five-aught because, and two different styles of hooks as well. I wanted for the straight shank flippers, whenever I'm flipping grass, generally I'm flipping a straight shank hook, a four out straight shank. When I flip wood, I flip an EWG style hook. I use, like I say, my hook sets are different. My lines are different. My rods are different. Um, the EWG style, I have no problems with when I flip fluorocarbon, but I, I have a slack line hook set. And I wanted that bait to be able to hold all those variances of hooks. So. Do I use a four out? I use a four out across the board. Um, there are times that I go down to a three out. There are times that I go to a five out. If I'm flipping wood and at Sam Rayburn and I've got, you know, big fish there and a lot of, you know, I'll flip a five out on that place. I sure will because they'll eat it. And uh, you just, you get a big hook in them and I like it. Yeah. That's interesting. It, it's no, always was, Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Bailey. I was going to add that it's, a, it's an interesting process of, it's something that I've been trying to look into in the past, you know, maybe two, three years of knowing when to throw a three out versus a four or a five out. That's, I think that was good that you touched on that. But yeah, and I want to make this really clear too. Three out, like I've had people send me back some pictures and stuff of the, their setups and stuff. The BFE is a thick bait. I made it thick so that it would hold the hook for a long time. I don't want the head to tear out and stuff, you know, like a lot of baits on the market. So therefore, you've got more body to penetrate than a lot of baits. A three out, quite honestly, unless you're doing it to punch mat specifically to get through, it's too small of a hook. There's no reason you shouldn't be using a four or five out hook. No reason at all. It'll hold both those hooks. Use them to your advantage. 
That's a really good point. Awesome. Andy, what were you going to say? Oh, I was going to – you already touched on I was going to ask you what the – like if the BFE was a softer or harder body bait because – tubes tend to have like a hard head on them than that real soft body where they compress mm -hmm. real easily like almost like a hollow belly or is it just so salt impregnated that it you can almost squeeze it with your finger but then it comes back to shape right Heck yeah we talked about that when we designed the bfe about making the head harder um did not end up doing it um, i left the whole bait the same so the whole bait's pretty soft um just for the overall action of the bait it was just a better it was it was a it was an easier better design than than trying to make the head hard. I did think about that, but but it ended up being part of why my diameter is it's a little bit bigger than a big brush hog, you know. Mm -hmm. The actual plastic of the diameter that's a it's just a little bit bigger than 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 a big brush hog, and you know I've caught a lot of fish flipping that bait as well, and it you know it holds a four out and a five out, which is the big one. I flip a five, but. Um, I knew that was enough penetration that I could that I could design. The BFE's also got a slit down one side of it, and that slit is specifically there for guys using the straight shank hook, so that you get enough gap to bite, you know, in your curl of the hook, so that that bait still slides down and you get a good hook in a fish. Like I said, there was a lot of thought that went into that bait. It wasn't just a. I wanted one that I wanted one that we could catch fish on. Like they were going to give me the opportunity to do it, and I didn't take that opportunity lightly. So. I've been doing it a long time. I knew about what I wanted and spent a lot of time making that thing right. And um, the feedback has come back. That, dude, there's a lot of people talking about it, a lot of people flipping it. Um, it's going to be a big player come this spring when flipping comes into effect. Yeah, I think you can also get pretty creative with it too. I feel like, you know, making that vertical on a chatterbait would be decent or on a swing head or on a, as a jig trailer. I feel like you can do it different ways. And I think that, um, you know, after that opportunity, this has worked so well, I'm going to get some more. So um, I'm working on a couple of designs right now, as a matter of fact, for uh, Big Bite as we speak. Um, I, I was working on looking at some drawings today. So um, may not be a flipping bait, maybe a flipping bait. I've got I've got I've got a couple of ideas some different stuff, but maybe some jig trailers, maybe another flipping bait. But kind of keep it in that BFE line of family, but definitely different designs. Heck yeah. I'm a big fan of the uh, the Kamikaze Swim On. Yeah, I am too. I, I like the Kamikaze Swim on a lot as well. That's actually where I got the range for the BFE. Were you know pretty close to it. Um, I, they had had that bait out, and I saw it. And you know, I was wanting to go with the tubular size without being hollow, and so it had to have rings on it. That's basically what had to happen. So right. we kind of used those rings that they already had and went from there. Right. So we only have a, a you know one or two more questions here from the viewers, and then uh, we're going to hit you with our, our last question and wrap up. I'm sure Andy here is itching to go, uh, you know, yell at his Bills game going on. I, I think I, I got a few going on in the background. From the I'm rough. pretty sure. What's, my wife, what's, what's the score? What's the score? 17-9 uh, Bills, and they're driving about to score again. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, against the oh, Patriots. My wife just wrote it, and she said it's 23-9, but I'm, I'm like 30 seconds behind. All right. So, thanks. <laughs> You gonna get the first? Are you gonna get the first week by with this win? Is that what happens? Second place nope. in the AFC. We're, you get the going for, we're gonna get probably the sec. We're hoping for the second seed to get two playoff games at home. Uh, okay. So then hopefully we can make it through. Then play Kansas City and Kansas City in the conference finals. Gotcha. All right. Apparently, All right. it's a fifty-yard touchdown pass to Diggs. Is what just happened. <laughs> <laughs> and it was. Is it against uh, Stefan Gilmore? That's my last question, then we'll move on to fishing. Gilmore out. has a torn meniscus in his knee. Oh, he's, out for, he's probably out forever. So oh, that sucks. Well, so so J Rod here asked, uh, you know, what size weight you're you know, you're flipping the BFE on hard structures with fluoro. Uh I'm sure obviously that's variable on depth and what you're doing, but you know, kind of like a what's your your I guess your general rule of thumb when it goes to sizes and flipping uh size of line and flipping things like that and then the so weight. your Just weight big you know, singer. yeah well, that is a good question um on hardwood the depth makes a huge difference so like some of the lakes we go to like let's say a beaver lake in arkansas or texoma in oklahoma some of them fluctuate in extreme amounts even rayburn um, when we start talking about flipping four or five foot deep trees or bushes, you know, like they're that tall and the fish are at the base of it, fluorocarbon's out. Y'all with me on that? Because 
one, I'm going to be using a lot bigger weight because I don't have time to sit there and wait for a 316 to hit bottom in seven foot of water if I'm flipping a seven foot deep tree. Um, cypress trees at Rayburn can get this way. Um, but anyway, so the depth does have an effect on it. So like if it's a really deep impoundment, which you guys where you live don't really have that, mm -hmm. that maximum of a swing, right? So like they, they don't swing 30 feet like these man-made reservoirs do down here. But um, for the most part, we're usually talking about water that's one to four foot high, right? And even when the lakes are four to five foot high, even down here, a lot of times I'm still trying to get to the bank where the fish are still only a foot deep. So I'm only flipping then usually, I would say that my mainstay is a quarter ounce, and a quarter and a three eighths ounce on 25 pound test fluorocarbon, on sunlight fluorocarbon. And I generally flip the shooter. So that is pretty much my primary flipping situation. I use a seven foot three Amistad extra heavy on the fluorocarbon setup. Hmm. That's great. That, that's something I don't really, I don't know why I've always kind of been like when I flip, I go for the reaction bite. I don't know why I'm, I'm so hard headed when it comes to that. Cause I always, if, I, if I'm flipping like, especially like say grass up here up North, it's a half mm -hmm. or a quarter. But I think one thing, you know, talking about that, I need to try to force myself to do this year is play around with some smaller size weights. This is actually something that Andy and I were talking about what yesterday, two days ago. Yeah. So yeah. my my three main sizes I use are three eighths, five sixteenths, and seven sixteenths. And then every mm -hmm. once in a while, I'll just jump and go right to five eighths. Like really? I skip a half. I I think a half is almost a useless weight because I could use a seven sixteenth mm -hmm. on some baits or go to a five eighth on a slower falling bait and get that almost half ounce reaction bite that Bailey's looking for, depending uh, on the bait I'm using. I don't like a half. <laughs> what time of year are you guys talking about primarily that you're doing this? Um, I mostly flip summer going into fall, mm -hmm. mostly because we have to wait for our grass to grow or we're just flipping trees, which I have a couple little impoundments that I fish that are tree and bush based. But mostly I don't bust out the flipping stuff till summer. And so what depth are we talking about then when you're flipping grass in the summer, generally speaking? Anywhere from four to 20. Okay. Yeah. That's about <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's why you like those depths or right. those size weights and things. So like um, I've made a lot of money with a 316 sounds, a lot mm -hmm. of big ones flipping pre-spawn to spawn water that you can't see a foot, you know, you can't see six inches deep and those fish will literally be sitting six to, you know, 18 inches deep, but they're no deeper than 18, you know, and you're going over a bush limb through a bush limb and then down 12 inches and that fish is right there. Um, a half ounce, Help three eighths ounce is too is too much when they're in the spawning. Mm -hmm. They're in that mood, you know, where you know, like when stick baits work and stuff. Um, but that three sixteenths on a tube, you know, that's slower. You'll get her every time. And uh, so, yeah, a lot of it's time of year in the depth. So, like I say, you know, then we go to the half ounces and things like that. But anytime I start flipping, like where you guys are talking about, man, I'm flipping braid. You guys aren't flipping braid. You guys are flipping floral, or you guys are flipping braid. Um, I, I played around a lot with leader, to be quite frank. Okay. If not, I'm going mainly to all floral. Yeah. I'm. Do you think? I'm do like, you think that you get more bites because of the floral? That's. See, I feel like you know the, the argument over over bites with braid to floral. I feel like there isn't really that big of a difference in bites, but for me mentally, if there is a chance, I'm going to get more bites if I throw a twenty pound floral over like a 40, 50 pound braid, I'm going to throw the floor. That's just kind of how my mind works. It's trying to maximize my potential. Uh, whereas I'm sure throwing braid is just fine. What about so your, I, so what knot are you tying for your floor road braid? I'm throwing FG. Uh, I've okay. learned that this past winter. Okay. I, I go, was it the Alberto where you just uh -huh. wrap it over a few times and back? What I'll do though, when I'm flipping, like if I go, a 30 pound braid to say 20 pound or 17 pound test floro. They usually say you only need like three to five wraps. I'll actually go like eight to nine wraps and try to elongate the knot slightly. So it comes through the guides a little better. Okay. But I, I, I am mostly a straight floro guy when flipping because our grass and where we're at in New York doesn't get all that thick. Mm -hmm. So I feel like I don't really need to go to braid. I don't even, the only rod I really had braid on last year until I made the switch late in the season was my frog rod. 
But I do like braid when I had to flip like pads and weeds because I feel like the braid cuts the pads better than floral. Do you feel like that most of your bites, both of y'all feel like they come on the initial fall when you're using above a half ounce weight? Yeah, and that's usually why I'm th that's why I've at least for me has been com it's become more comfortable or more of like in my brain where it's you know throwing a half or three quarters. It's because I usually my first bite when I am flipping grass is that first flip, that first drop. Mm -hmm which I think is why I've stayed at a half to a three quarters. But obviously, you know, upon talking, it's something I think I need to experiment with some, some level of weights as well. Yeah, it, when, whenever they eat it on that initial fall, you know, in my mind, if, if I'm, especially if I'm throwing three quarter heavier, but they're not having a time to inspect a fishing line. You know, they see yeah. the bait, they're just, they're just reacting to the bait instantly. Um, and, and and so like braid situations, you're talking about a 30 pound braid list that I mean like that thought process. And I'm not saying you guys are wrong. I, no. I could be totally wrong on this. That process doesn't even go through my mind. Like I'm 65 pound straight to the line. I mean, like, what's the point in doing anything else? Because she's not looking at it. So, uh, you know, I can remember flipping. I had a tournament there that I did pretty well on Oneida and I caught every one of them flipping an ounce and a quarter weight on smallmouth. So smallmouth were out in that, whatever that weird grass is that grows there. I just I just flipped all day long with an ounce and a quarter on sixty five pound braid and caught a pretty good smallmouth doing it. That's fun. We have a yeah. account here from TJ Val, who's a, a local hammer up here by Andy and I. He says he's apparently all braids. So I guess that there's an example of someone who's he's using braid up here. And I think it's I think it's still a mental thing for me. So I think it's just one of those things where I just got to go out fun fishing for a day. Yeah. So if you're under. putting it in there and you're having to yo-yo it before they eat it, or you're putting it in there and you're hopping it a couple times before they eat it, then yeah, I can definitely see fluorocarbon. I can definitely see 17 pound fluorocarbon and the 30 pound, you know, trying to stay lighter on that deal. I can see all that, but if it's a big weight and it's, it's the initial fall, I don't see an advantage not just going as big as you possibly can. See, that's where like, I like, I have a flipping setup last year towards three quarters of the way through our season. I actually fished the same bait on two different setups. And I actually found that I liked it a little better on the braid to fluoro setup that I was using because yes, I was flipping grass, but I was almost letting it soak okay. because they weren't getting it on that initial fall. Mm -hmm. And I can yeah. almost feel them like, you know, like some people say they can feel the fish breathing on the bait. With that braid, I felt like there was points where I'd be like, oh, I'm about to get bit because there's something there and as to where with floral, you can almost feel it, but sometimes you might pull it out a half second too soon. So what I found was when I was going with like that 7 16 or 5 8 ounce, I would go straight floral. But if I was using that 5 16 or sometimes 3 8 I would actually go that braid to floral because I could almost let it soak, but I'd have a little bit of an increased sensitivity in an area that I knew I was fishing. I would come in guns blazing with the floro and then slow down and go to the other rod once I got bites and the bite shut off. So the reason that I really was quizzing y'all hard about it was because I, I do think that there is the opportunity for me to be wrong on this subject right here matter because what I'm preaching and what I know is a lot of from 15, 20 years of experience. And what I also know from that experience is, is that fish change and mm -hmm. pressure is changing these fish every day. And I can see where pressure, the clarity of you guys is water and, and the scenarios that are going on that you can get twice as many bites, maybe even three times as many bites by flipping fluoro over braid if the fish are really starting to figure that deal out. Um, and that's why I was kind of asking all the questions you guys have got. I, I know that I saw I saw an opportunity one time on Toledo Bend. We were flipping deep grass. You know, I'm talking 20 foot outside high drill lines. And, like, that stuff used to never matter. You're like, it was just big jig, big line. You know, we called them scrapes. You catch big and one after the other. It was super fun. But it kind of went away, and, and it was in the fall when fishing was tough, and I started flipping some fluorocarbon. Even though it was deep, Toledo was clear at that time, and – I got more bites on the floor carbon. There was no doubt about it. Steve Kennedy and I were staying next to each other. He was doing the same thing. We had the discussion and he felt the same as I did that we got more bites on floor carbon. But dude, it's hard to get a freaking hook in them that, that deep with that big of a jig, you know, in, that, in grass. Because even though it's no stretch line, it still stretches a little bit. So that's mm -hmm. that's where I almost like the whole floral carbon to braid leader, like the yeah. braid using the floral leader, because I felt like I could get a better hook into them on that deeper grass using a lighter weight 
but half the time, I'll be honest, like you could feel them bite it, but you would see them bite it before you would actually feel them because of the braid, because of how sensitive it is. You just see that little jump. If you really pay attention, you would, your line would do something different. Yep. And before yep. you actually feel them, you can actually hit them. So, and I think that's sure. where it comes from. I, I use a super bright braid to like a 15 foot floral leader. I, I, where my knot is, I put it right behind the first guide on my rod. So when I'm flipping eight foot of water, literally all that's in the water mostly is my floral. But the braid, I can kind of see it on top and it can do different things as I'm pulling it up. How long do you make your leader, Bailey? Basically, I had to go with um, from rod tip to reel, essentially. Okay. That's just kind of how I keep it. Steve, seven foot leader. Yeah. yeah. And you're you're running, Andy. You're running like a double like, that, like 16, yeah, like ten, like ten to eleven. Okay. And the whole thing is, I don't want that not getting into my reel, so I yeah. stop it to a point because I I don't even have a net in my boat. I just flip everything because our fish aren't big enough in New York. So, but um, <laughs> I, tie, I tie the same knot you do. I haven't I haven't jacked with the FG just because I feel like that other knot, the Albright knot, has worked for so well for me for so long, but. I know that that FG knot is very seamless. Mm -hmm. And so like now that you've got it down, Bailey, do you like prefer it way over the Albright? Do you think it's just way better? Yeah. I mean, I've used the Albright prior and I've broke on a couple of fish and I'm sure it was my fault, not the knot's fault, but just mentally going to the FG and just seeing, you know, how strong it has been and specifically trying to, to overpower fish just to try to test the knot. Uh, I've, I've become a believer in it. So okay. I, something I've, I've used and obviously, you know, I've, there's been cases where I have made my leader too long and obviously it comes through the guides. So when I do flip and that leader not goes through the guides, I don't feel it at all, which is kind of nice. Of, like you said, how slender that knot can be. I, yeah, think, uh, I, I, think, I think that may be something that I need to work on this off season is that FG knot. I, I honestly, you know, we get stubborn. We've done this for a long time and you're like, Oh, this mm -hmm. works for me. But, um, there's always room for improvement. That's why I was drilling you guys about the, uh, the the leader. Maybe that's something that I work on in 2021. My flipping is uh, some fluorocarbon to braid leaders. So the one thing that I would say about Albright, Alberta, I don't know exactly what it's called. When I go like the eight or I'll go like six to eight wraps with that heavier line to the braid. Mm -hmm. When I pull on it, sometimes that knot will have a tendency to like make almost a, like a little ball. Do you know what I'm talking about? Where it gets yeah. real tight and compact. What I found is if you cinch it real slow, you mm -hmm. can almost elongate it out sort of like the FG knot and get it real cinched in tight. So it yeah. comes through those guides super clean, but it takes a long time to really work it out to the diameter that you need to have it come through properly. I've, I've noticed with knots with guys through the years, um, even with pro anglers, there's, there's, there's certain knots for whatever reason that certain guys will tie extremely well. Like there's the polymer knot, right? There are guys that tie the polymer better than other guys. Um, there's a couple of tricks to that, but just just generally speaking, so like the Albright or what else did you say it could be called? Alberto, I be, I'm gonna be wrong about Albright. That may not be it. I, it so. be, I think it's Alberto, but it could be Albright. I don't know. <laughs> the Alberto knots. I, I, names, yeah. I, actually, I call it the. Uh, the Matt, uh, I just went blank, called it this forever because he's the one that talked to me. But um, Matt talked to me a long, long time ago, and, and I've always just called it his knot. I don't know why I've just gone completely blank. Matt, big Matt, uh, fish on the Elite Seas forever. That's where he taught it to me. Uh, Heron? Guy, no, guys down on Lake Falcon. Uh, he was uh, Edwin Evers and him were team partners forever down in Texas. He's super, he was the president of the PAA. I don't, I've gone completely blank. Anyway, so uh, Matt, taught me, Matt taught me the knot, and uh, I've always just called it his knot. But, yeah, it, it's the same one you're talking about. It's the one with all the, you know, you, you just double over your head. Yeah. Go yeah. Eight back down and cinch it tight. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, Matt Reed. Matt Reed knot. That's it. Okay. Nice. Well, Andy, you got anything left for, for Bradley before we hit him? Nah, with that question? Yeah, hit him with the home run, the, the best uh, question of the night. I have to say, this has felt – extremely like a quick episode and i'm looking at the timer right here and we're at yeah, like holy crap an hour 40 <laughs> yeah i don't like this is probably i think this might be our longest episode which is uh, i feel like we have so much we can expand on too so we'll definitely have to have you on again awesome. 
but our last question for you is one that we ask everybody who's new to the show, uh, and that is if you, know, if you could sit down, have a beer, have a steak with three different individuals uh, that don't have to be uh, fishing related, don't don't have to be fishing industry, they don't have to be alive currently. But what three individuals are you going to invite and you know sit down, have a beer, have a steak, pick their brain? Wheels are turning. I see it. I love it. God, that's a great question. The stumper. Well, I know him a little bit, but um, I always enjoy the opportunity. Anytime I see him. Barry Switzer was a legendary coach at the University of Oklahoma and won a few national titles. And he's in his 80s now, but the, the guy was just an incredible person and still is, and his brain was exceptional. So Barry Switzer would be one. Um, golly, man, there's a lot of great people in this world. I'd like to sit down and have a beer and a steak with. Now, you should have gave me this question at the beginning of the show so I could have thought about it. Not allowed. Yeah. 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 Not yeah. Guest rules. <laughs> yeah. No preparation for that one. <laughs> Makes you think on the spot. It's a good. It's one. almost like a gut thing. You gotta go with your gut. Just. Spit it out. I know, but I'm going to be like, I'm going to just throw a bunch of dumb names out there, and then I'm going to get off the phone, and I'm going to be like, why would you want to go with him? Like, you had this guy you could have gone with. Food? Like, what were you thinking? (laughs) Give me more food for thought for the next episode to come on. (laughs) I have a great idea, Bailey. So whenever we start getting somebody on Segway here, rabbit hole, we should ask them, like, so have you thought about your three choices of a steak and a beer, and would you change any of them every time somebody comes on for a second time? Because that answer will always be different, I bet. Man, I can think of some pretty important people that I'd like to have a steak and a beer with. Uh, Jesus comes to mind. That would be a good one. Why? It's good to choose. Um, and I, maybe it's I got Jesus, Barry Switzer. <laughs> <laughs> See where we're going here. That'd be blessed uh, by Jesus. That man was. Uh, <laughs> I would like to sit down and have a steak dinner with Lewis and Clark. Lewis and Clark from the same Lewis and Clark that went across this awesome. continent, first white, you know, Americans to travel all the way across our continent. Dude, they thought there was a waterway to take to the Pacific Ocean, and there wasn't. But um, almost those, like three quarters of the way. Those two men would be pretty amazing to uh, sit down and talk to about that that trip and uh, all they encountered and how they. Did you realize they took like thirty people with them and only one person died? They were a three year trip there and back, and only one died, and he died from appendicitis. Like he would have died <laughs> that time, no matter if he'd have been in Chicago, he would have died. That's <laughs> true. How, how is that even possible? Like, <laughs> The Indians had never even seen white man before. And somehow they, you know, the couple times that they just about died, women came to their, you know, a couple of women saved them. And, and, and it's just amazing. But yeah, Lewis and Clark. Be a great question, question for Jesus and God be like, why did you allow them to go through with that trip? Yeah, so Jesus and Lewis and Clark from Barry Switzer. Man, that sounds pretty open. If I don't know it's Oklahoma, that's it right there. But uh, I have yeah. to say, and and no offense to the our uh, numerous amounts of other guests, but that is probably the most interesting answer I think we've ever gotten. Uh, that's I mean, there's so many oh, more people talking. What about, it's not going to be Kevin Van Dam and Greg Hackney. It's not going to be that man. I've got better answers than that. For- but like, if I get the chance to do that, and I tell you, I'm going to get off this. I love that question because I'm going to get off here. I hope y'all have me on again sometime. I'm going to have even better answers. Oh heck yeah, dude! You're always welcome. It, it's such a fun question because, like, like you just said, we get messages of people saying, "Oh, I should have said this person," right? Like right afterwards, they're like, "Oh, I should have said this person." And it makes me think for a while, which is kind of cool. And like, uh, I've had people come back and say, "Like, oh, like you saying that kind of sparked something." I went and reached out to him and talked to him. Like, it's kind of cool, but it's a uh, Lewis and Clark, I think, would be so interesting to ask them, like, story, like, get a story time, sit down by a fire. Oh, yeah. Be like, what's the craziest crap you guys saw? <laughs> oh, because you know there's so much crap undocumented. because yeah, that was the OG United States before it was even United States. It wasn't even, didn't even have a name. And it's like, that's when, like, everything was untucked. 
Yeah. yeah, we didn't even own California. They just went into the Oregon Territory, and it wasn't even part of the United States at that time. It was owned by somebody else. And we just bought the, uh, you know, the, the the middle part of the United States through the Louisiana Purchase. Yeah. And uh, from France, I think at the time, and yeah. which was like the best land deal of all time. They bought it for like something stupid, like two dollars an acre or something. <laughs> yeah, just to like learn too, like what the Native Americans are doing, like mechanically. Like this is to operate. I feel like the, you know, tools, I don't know. That kind of history stuff has always intrigued me. Me too. But yeah. That's, that's a really good answer. I think that's my favorite answer ever on the show. Yeah. That's, that's awesome. That's legit. Yeah. I always well, forget about Lewis and Clark too, until somebody like randomly mentions like, Holy crap. And like that story is just incredible. So like, I'll throw this, I'll throw this out. Oregon trail. I'll throw this out there like the Buck Perry. So if now now we're all streaming, you know how our lives are. So get on Amazon tonight, and there's a episode. Uh, Ken Burns did a did a documentary on it. I believe it's two two parts, and they're like it's probably about four hours long. Just on Lewis and Clark, it's a great it's a great one. I haven't seen it in a year few years, but you guys should watch that. Ken Burns. You can just Google it up on Amazon. Probably cost you like four dollars to buy it or something, you know. And then you'll always have it. I'll have to take that. Yeah. All right. Well, I figured out what I'm doing after this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm watching the Bills game. Not going to lie. <laughs> <laughs> That's too funny. Well, Bradley, seriously, dude, thank you so much for, for taking time. A lot of time out of your night thank tonight. You. It's, we appreciate you answering all the folks' questions, our questions. And we got we gotten some pretty good stuff. And I, we do appreciate the information. And hey, I, I appreciate you guys time. having me on, dude. Seriously, I, I enjoy any of these. Uh, anytime I, I, I can sit and talk fishing all night. Yeah, you've been a popular guy lately. So we appreciate you hopping in. Yeah, absolutely, man. Thank you. Yeah, it's like as soon as we reached out to you to come on the show, you look around, there's like three other platforms, Bradley Home and Bradley Home and Bradley Home. And we're like, oh, okay, let's relate to the show. <laughs> <laughs> you guys aren't right. Dude, I enjoy working. Like Watson was talking about it one time, James and I are good friends. And there was a point when James was on everything. James like, dude, if they'll let me run my mouth, I'll get on there and talk nonstop every single night on every platform known to man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think that's the one like commonplace fishermen have is that we all talk. Yeah. Like oh, if, yeah. you, if you don't talk, you're not a fisherman. You have to talk oh, yeah. from, from the stories of your bluegill when you're four years old that were actually this big, but they're this big, and it's like a world class. Hey, where are those pictures, Dad? Where are those big brim we catch there like this? <laughs> and then you finally see the picture, and you're like, "Hey, they weren't even that big." I was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Heck yeah. Well, dude, uh, thanks again. We appreciate it. You are always welcome on the show. We'll definitely have you on again. Hey, here down good road. luck in 2021. Safe travels. Yeah. We'll be uh, rooting for you. And, yeah. I'm going to get it done. I promise, boys. I'm going to get it done. Heck, Heck yeah. yeah. All, All right. right man. Take care. All right. Bye. Dude, wait. <laughs> that was so much. Awesome. That, we're almost going on two hours. <laughs> That's insane. That that was a lot of fun. Seriously, huge thank you to uh, Bradley Holman for uh, – and getting on with us and talking for almost almost two hours. Heck yeah. That's uh, easily the longest episode. I think there was a lot, a lot of really good information to come from that. And, uh, dude, huge thank you to you for taking two hours out of your night because I know how big of a Bills fan you are. And dude, I, don't I, worry. I don't know. It was the whole time. I'm sure you saw me peep. I, know. I, I can hear the rest wrestling in, in the background, but I, I appreciate was... you coming on through that. It's uh, But that was a really, really good episode. I think people Heck yeah. a lot of good information from it and but. I, it's funny when he said like there's a time and a place for three sixteenths and quarter i'm not gonna lie i just bought a ton of three sixteenth and quarters because it's something that i lack in trying and using and i'm like next summer when i'm flipping i'm going to do it in certain situations because i think there's going to be a certain time where I can get more bites and really maximize my efficiency when I'm on the water. And so just slugging the seven sixteenth ounce weight underneath every dock. And <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I think that adds to the list of something that I need to broaden my horizon with. Cause like, like we mentioned, this is a conversation we literally had yesterday or two days ago. And yeah. I would admit my, I'll, I'll admit, I'll fess up to it as like, I've specifically said, I don't think there's any reason you shouldn't have to use a, anything different than a three eighths half or three quarters. I said that verbatim. Yeah. And I think that's something I need to experiment with. And, and then Brad comes in and is like three sixteenth. And I was like, like <laughs> when you said that, I was like, first thing Andy's going to say after this is he's like, see, he told you. <laughs> 100%.
drink rich. <laughs> Rick and Rich left for a, uh, a club meeting. A mass open mass club meeting, yeah. So when yeah. he re-listens, drink. Drink <laughs> two hours later. <laughs> That's too funny. But thank you guys always for, for joining in. I, I think our last vote of business. Yeah, I'm, I'm getting to it. Come on now. Actually, let me, go, <laughs> let me go grab the hats for you guys. Let me see if I can get them over here. Where'd they go? Oh, never mind. They're in the car. Whoops. They're not. They're right. not up here in the room, unfortunately. Unless I'm going crazy. Wait, my room is kind of a mess. But the two uh, serious angler hats that we were giving away, uh, the winners are Zeb Matthews Fishing. Uh, if you are watching or listening, reach out to us, but we'll reach out to you on Instagram. And Seafish Catch Fish. So we'll reach out Congrats. to you. So congratulations. Some we're sending you swag. Yeah, we're going to send you some two serious angler hats. And uh, we're thinking about running another giveaway coming up here soon. Let us know what you guys would be interested in. Uh, we have some pretty sweet stuff on the online apparel store that we have linked. Just go to our social media or down below. There's a link if, you're, if you want to get some serious angler swag. But congratulations to you guys. We're going to get uh, those hats sent out. Uh, but as always, guys, we appreciate you guys coming on. And uh, we, had, we had a pretty pretty big live audience tonight. So huge thank you Sweet. to you guys. It was a lot of fun. And on Wednesday, we're going to have on Jeff and KJ Queen from Queen Tackle to talk to KJ about uh, obviously making and qualifying for the Elite, uh, the Elite Series through the Opens. But also KJ and Jeff are the owners of Queen Tackle, who, who many may not know is an extremely innovative terminal tackle company. We're going to talk. It's going to be a very juicy episode tomorrow or not tomorrow. Excuse me on Wednesday. Yeah. But, uh, Make sure you guys listen to that one. That's going to be fun. Heck yeah. Appreciate you guys as always for tuning in and listening. We'll see you guys on Wednesday.